Jupiter is not Earth's shield, according to a misconception that needs to be dispelled. We are well familiar with it. The perilous event of a cosmic impact is one of the most existential risks to life on Earth. A sufficiently energetic collision with Earth, which is typically caused by objects a few kilometers in size or larger, could easily result in a mass extinction event, sterilizing a living world and ending a chain of life that had evolved over billions of years. According to the images returned by interplanetary probes, such occurrences have almost always occurred throughout our solar system, leaving the moons and rocky planets' surfaces to resemble cratered battlefields. It has also happened here on Earth, but our planet's surface, which is fortunate enough to be constantly altered by internal and atmospheric forces, quickly manages to obliterate practically all signs. The Chicxulub Crater, a witness to the cataclysm that 66 million years ago instantly wiped out practically all the living animals of the Cretaceous epoch, is actually the most well-known example of what is left of our personal cosmic conflict. This crater was concealed until a few years ago. People in popular astronomical literature and mainstream culture accepted the idea that the Earth owed its life as a Garden of Eden to Jupiter's presence despite the terrible aftereffects of cosmic collisions. In fact, it was said that the gas giant served as a lightning rod for all of the cosmic projectiles that arrived from the depths of space and attempted to strike our lovely planet in some form due to its disproportionate mass, capable of generating an extremely extended gravitational field. Briefly said, there would have been so many disastrous impacts without Jupiter functioning as a cosmic hoover sucking up these threatening objects that life on Earth likely would not have evolved and we would not be here today. At least, that was the Vulgate that was widely accepted. And we held on to that conviction practically up to the present day, until someone wanted to put it to the test. With what outcomes? Simply keep following us to find out. Let's go back in time to the night of June 14, 1770, when the renowned astronomer Charles Messier made the discovery of a faint comet in the constellation of Sagittarius to start our tale. Although the comet was not the first or the last one the French astronomers saw, it would turn out to be one of the most intriguing and hazardous objects ever observed in Earth's skies. In fact, over the course of the following several nights, the comet swiftly became bigger and brighter until it was visible to the naked eye. On July 1st, the comet, as it would later be known, traveled at an incredible speed across the sky and passed just 2.2 million kilometers from Earth. The comet's nearest approach to our planet is still a record. The last reported observation of the comet was made by Messier in early October. It later dimmed but remained visible for several months. European observers welcomed the surprised cosmic visitor and then immediately started going through the data they had gathered to try to determine what kind of orbit the comet had taken. They also considered a very long period comet, like Halley's Comet, that had come from somewhere unknown and was destined to return to the depths of space at a moment in history when astronomers were still striving to comprehend the nature of these strange-tailed celestial animals. First to be able to calculate the comet's orbit was the Swedish astronomer Anders Lexel, who was surprised to discover that it had a brief duration of only 5.6 years. This instantly prompted the question of why it had never been seen before if its orbit caused it to pass close to Earth every few years. Why was the comet never seen again after that? Astronomers were able to solve the puzzle by extrapolating the comet's trajectory backward and forward in time, and they found that Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, was the only one who could have caused the comet's sudden appearance and equally sudden disappearance. In fact, it was found that the comet had approached Jupiter in 1767 while traveling on a much longer orbit, following a path that could never have led it in the direction of Earth. The comet was most likely one of a population of objects now known as centaurs, icy cometary nuclei orbiting in the outer solar system between Jupiter and Neptune. But as it approached Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, its gravity pulled it just far enough to propel it into a much smaller orbit that would inadvertently intersect the path of our planet in a few years. But why did the comet disappear after that and never come back to see us? 
However, it appears that just 12 years after its initial encounter with Jupiter, the comet approached the giant planet once more and may even have been launched outward, away from the inner solar system, according to calculations made in the following decades by the prodigious celestial mechanics experts. We don't know exactly where it ended up because we can't tell from our observations of its 1770 appearance what might have happened to it. The comet had been pushed into an orbit where it could no longer pose a threat to Earth, but one thing was certain. Therefore, it could be stated that Jupiter had, at least in this instance, acted as both the villain and the heroic savior of Earth. But what prompted scientists to adopt the impenetrable shield notion of Jupiter if it had already been known a few centuries earlier that Jupiter may have this dual nature of shield and sling towards the Earth? Finding the roots of the Jupiter as a shield hypothesis is difficult. A 1994 paper written by geophysicist George Wetherill is the only one to mention the possibility that, in the absence of a massive planet like Jupiter at the proper distance from the Sun, the inner solar system might have been threatened by a comet flux from the Oort cloud 1,000 times greater than what we currently observe. However, the original concept had to go back even farther because this was already being taken for granted in many periodicals in the 1980s. An extremely charming and sentimental theory, but one that is in no way supported by calculations. During those years, the only explanation for the apparent large difference in the cratering rates of the two lunar hemispheres, the far and the near, was that the near hemisphere was protected, in a sense, by the weighty presence of the Earth, whereas the far hemisphere was completely exposed to space, where asteroids and comets could strike the lunar surface without hindrance. Even however, the theory persisted for a while before it was discovered that the difference resided in the thickness of the lunar crust, which was thinner in the hemisphere facing Earth, as we also demonstrated in our movie Why Are the Two Sides of the Moon So Different in Conclusion? If there is anything to be learned from these disasters, it is that common sense and spur-of-the-moment assumptions can frequently fail terribly. The answer? The standard one is to use the scientific approach and search for proof. Wetherill certainly made an effort. In actuality, his conclusions came from computer simulations, although there was no processing capacity at the time. The situation has significantly improved recently, and several teams of astronomers have been busy testing Wetherill's theories by simulating various versions of our solar system on computers, including one with Jupiter present and one without, as well as three with planets that are, respectively, one quarter, one-half, and three-quarters of its mass. Asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, centaurs orbiting between Jupiter and Neptune, and long-period comets from the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud were among the 100,000 items that were simulated by the virtual system. Results acquired after tens of millions of years in the virtual realm refuted Wetherill's idea by demonstrating that, instead of shielding us from cosmic disasters, Jupiter's existence in the solar system actually causes an overall 30% increase in collisions with Earth. We reiterate that this is taken into account when looking at all 100,000 tracked objects in the simulation. Regarding the impact of Jupiter on asteroids in the main belt, the surprise peaked when it became clear that the gas giant has an even more disastrous impact, increasing the number of asteroids headed for our planet by up to 72%. The simulation only showed no change in the frequency of hits for the long-term comet population. As if to suggest that Jupiter's existence only prevents damage to Earth from occurring in the case of comets from the outer solar system, which are considerably rarer than the asteroids it might instead influence at will. All of this leads us back to the age-old debate of whether Jupiter is Earth's ally or enemy, or simply uninterested. Given what little we do know and what we have just said, it is reasonable to assume that the majority of asteroids that have struck the Earth over time, including most likely the one that threatened the empire of the great reptiles, would not have reached the target if Jupiter's malevolent ability to disrupt their orbits before they intersected the orbit of our planet had not existed. In conclusion, Jupiter must be viewed as Earth's enemy, contrary to earlier belief. However, simulations have also demonstrated that the plot is far more nuanced than first meets the eye, not least because there is a different viewpoint to take into account, which is it? Well, so to put it simply, 
a newly formed, barren planet may have been transformed into the amazingly hospitable globe we know today by impacts on our planet. Earth might have remained a desiccated shell or a desolate planet without the asteroids and other items ejected by Jupiter from the asteroid belt and the outer solar system. Ultimately, a young Earth would have received billions of tons of water mixed with organic molecules from the gas giant planets and billions of years of unrelenting bombardment, a huge gift of welcome. Although the dinosaurs would ultimately pay the price of the ticket in the grand game of the cycle of life and death, something that Jupiter will never be pardoned for.